So hello everybody, um, good evening or good afternoon wherever you are in the world. Thanks very much for joining us for this session, Managing Seizures and Epilepsy. I'm Gillian Hastings Ward. I am a board member at Cure Grin Foundation and I'm the mum of Sam who is seven years old um, and has a Grin 1 variant which is causing his epilepsy and other things. He's also just gone to bed in the room upstairs so apologies if you hear any background noise but hopefully that'll be okay. Um, I'm delighted today that we've been joined by Tim Benke and by Maureen Bennett and um, between them they bring a, a vast wealth of experience both of living with the Grin disorder and also studying it for many years. Um, Tim is um, research director at the University of Colorado Children's Hospital and in that role oversees around 150 clinical research studies including several that we're involved with at Cure Grin looking at various aspects of Grin disorder. Maureen is mum of Caitlin and Kylie and wife of Kevin and um, her family have been living with uh, Caitlin's uh, Grin disorder now for a number of years. So she's going to start off by giving us a, a flavour of, of how epilepsy impacts on their lives. Then we're going to hear from Tim and then hopefully we'll come back for some questions. So um, if those of us who are not speaking will just put our cameras off, then we can focus on our great speakers that we have today. Thanks. Thanks, Gillian. <laughs> Um, I'm so happy I get to be a part of this today, um, but I'll be completely honest with everybody. I'm mostly anxious to hear what Dr. Benke has to say. So I'm really just going to share my story, share Caitlin's story, and talk a little bit about our journey. Um, I don't have a lot of experience per se, like as in I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I just have, have a journey that we have taken with our girl. Um, so Caitlin kind of developed like a typical grin kid. First couple of months, everything was great. And then, um, you know, missing the milestones and kind of getting on the road of, of discovering her developmental delays. We did not see epilepsy initially. Um, her first seizures happened when Caitlin was about two. And they were, you know, kind of a mystery to us. We didn't actually even know that was exactly what was happening. But we went on to some medication. Six months later, we went off of the medication, kind of thinking this isn't really a thing. Um, along about age four, Caitlin started having a couple of seizures that would be related to being ill, having a fever, um, some kind of sickness where her body was, you know, fighting hard. And that's when she would have some seizures. They were fairly rare and they were all like an event. Like this is a big deal. She's having a seizure and we often ended up in the emergency room. At that point, we did start Keppra as our first medication. Um, to stave off further seizures. And over the next five or so years, it, she stayed on the medication. She had these occasional seizures. And again, I just never really felt like it was a big deal. Um, bear in mind, we also did not have a diagnosis with GRIN1 until Caitlin was 10 years old. So we just were working our way through developmental delays and all of the other um, pieces of her disability. Puberty changed everything. Right about two, three months before Caitlin turned 10, um, she started having real seizures and they were happening fast and furious. Um, initially trigger, a big trigger was startle. So noises and things were startling seizures, but they kind of evolved into all kinds of, of um, triggers that we couldn't really name. Um, and they were all different types of seizures from a true clonic tonic, tonic clonic seizure um, to sort of a more absent thing, um, kind of the gamut. So that was five years ago. Um, and I would love to say that we've kind of changed and our journey has progressed into a better light, but it has not. Um, right now, Caitlin um, has been on this road of pharmaceuticals, trying to find that key mix that will bring an end to these, um, to these terrible seizures. And so we were adding things to the Keppra like Onfi and Clobazam and Depakote. Depakote gave us some real success. That was kind of the first one to sort of give us some relief. Um, and then we ended up dropping out of Keppra and adding things like Riviac, um, Banzel, and most recently Topamax. She has stayed on two meds at a time. That is all. We have not had to um, go to a third. And approximately the seizures are happening like I would say anywhere from a week to two weeks in time. So when I sit back and I think about Caitlin's seizures, I think, well, that's not very many. You know, I know a lot of kids that have 
a lot more seizures than Caitlin does. However, I think that with Caitlin, um, her seizures are particularly challenging because they tend to cluster. So, and they are 99% nocturnal. So here's a couple of pictures of my girl. Um, the two side by side or the two on the edges are obviously seizure days. So a lot of times what happens is Caitlin will cluster with one seizure, then another, then another. And when you have only one, that's rough. When you have two or three really hard, difficult, severe, two to three minute long seizures, your body is just wiped. And so my poor girl with this every, you know, 10 days or so having these cluster seizures, she's, she's down for the count and you don't get those days back. Um, you know, she's missed a lot of school and she lays around in her bed or in her room. And that is, that is her day. It is a quiet, quiet day in her house. Um, we also discovered in that period of time that Caitlin would no longer eat or drink on a seizure day. And then that would carry on into the next day and potentially into the day after that. So um, in 2020, Caitlin lost 10 pounds in 10 months. And last November, she got a G-tube. And I'm happy to say that that has been a true blessing to Caitlin's ability to um, bounce back a little better and recover from her seizures. And, and, and it gives us a tremendous amount of, of stress relief um, in, in working with her. So these nocturnal seizures kind of carry on and we have been opening a lot of doors to study things like diet. Um, diet is a challenging one for a kiddo like Caitlin. Caitlin has always been a happy, happy, voracious eater. And then we have the seizure days where she doesn't want to eat anything and she's so picky that right now and for the last year and a half, when we should be considering and talking about diet, I've been mostly worried about her just getting nourished and having intake and having calories and having liquids. So diet is very much something that we know we need to consider. Um, I live in Colorado. I'm down the road from Dr. Benke. Um, I have incredible team support for Caitlin um, in neurology, but there are a lot of things that they cannot do. And um, so things like, you know, cannabis and some other approaches are also on our plate. So epilepsy is a thing. It's, it's, it's a part of Caitlin's life that I believe personally, if we get under control, gives her such a tremendous opportunity for improvement, for quality of life, for happier days. And that's what I think we all want mostly for our kiddos is to have fulfilling and, and really valuable lives. So I'm super excited to hear what Dr. Benke has to say. I My heart goes out to every single one of our Grin families, Gruya families who are working through seizures because in, you know, it's, it's tough. It is a, it's a tough road to hoe, um, but we're doing everything we can. And, and I'm just grateful for the research people and, and all of the studies that are being done to hopefully find not just cures for, for epilepsy, but for all of Grin. So thanks for having me. And thanks for sharing my story of my cute girl. Thanks very much, Maureen. That was really interesting. And um, straight over to Tim. Great. Let me share my screen. And there. Everybody can see my screen. Yes. Let me know if you can't. Great. Thank you, everybody, for asking me to be here. And thank you, Maureen, very much for that story. I think it's always uh, humbling in many ways to, to hear uh, how our uh, families are affected, and it just increases the imperative as we move forward to finding better ways of, of doing what we do. So what I've been asked to, to chat to you about today was seizures and spells, because it's not always clear what that was, and how we assess and treat these in, in grin disorders, but also just broadly uh, when we take care of many individuals who have things similar to grin disorders. Okay, let me make it go forward. There, here are my disclosures, nothing really related to what we're going to talk about, but here we go. So what I'm going to talk to you about are some key questions, and the next slide I'm going to show you is a bit busy, but I will talk through each one of the, the things uh, on that key question slide. The next are diagnostic tests and trying to understand what the spell was, then talk about possible therapies and talk about safety. So key questions. So here are the questions that I try to go through when I talk to families about an event or a spell. 
And so the first one is, is were you able to get a video from start to finish? And we'll talk more about that because it's hard to do. And I recognize that, that you are trying to, to ensure the safety of your child. And I'm asking you to somehow sprout a third arm uh, and to turn on your, your cell phone and video this. But what we really want to know are the features of the event. To describe it, uh, what happens first? What happens next? We really want to know start to finish. What are the eyes doing? What are they, are they looking at you? Are they stuck in one position? What are the arms doing? What are the legs doing? Are there, there repetitive movements or are they irregular and chaotic? And I ask families to demonstrate. And I know sometimes families are a little hesitant to do that, especially with their individual, they're present, but I, I sometimes like to, to dance it out as well to say, did it look like this? Uh, does your child have a change in color in their face? Do they get sweaty? Do they get cold? Do they hold their breath? Do they hyperventilate? What sort of noises are made during the spell? If you touch your child, does it interrupt or change the spell and do the spells cluster? How long ago did they start? Are they still happening? On average, how long does the spell last? What is the longest spell you have observed? On average, how often do they occur? What is the most frequent that you observed? Is there anything that you can trigger? Maureen talked about this uh, with Caitlin. Do they happen at a particular time of day? Also, this was part of uh, Caitlin's story. Do they happen with particular activity? Is there anything that seems to make the spell stop? What does your child do after the spell? Again, this is, seizures can be very impactful as we were hearing, and the child can be wiped out for the rest of the day. What has been done to make the spells better, shorter, or less frequent, like medications, foods, therapies, changes, the schedules, et cetera? What has been done that makes the spells worse, longer, more frequent? Uh, what tests have been done by your clinicians to try to figure these out? and what to do about them. And did it capture the spell you were concerned about? And this is this last uh, question is really important as part of the dialogue that you have with your clinicians. So with regards to the spells, you know, what are the possibilities? And that's important because that really asks the question, what are the treatments? So the description plus diagnostics hopefully gives an answer to suggest a therapy. And this is always a clinical decision. There's no one test that can just say, okay, that's what this is. It really is a discussion about what the context is because it can be a seizure, which would imply the need for anti-seizure medications, but it could also be a movement disorder, sleep disorder, autonomic instability, change in anatomy, behavioral, or a lot of times, unfortunately, we say, I don't know what that is. So epilepsy and grin disorders. So first of all, definition. So more than one unprovoked seizure is epilepsy. And what we know so far is that then in, and I'll, this is what we know from the registry, and this is how we know this. And the question is, is have you enrolled in the registry? So this is uh, data that's been published uh, largely from uh, uh, Johannes Lemke's uh, surveys. We have some surveys in parallel, which we're joining with Dr. Lemke to uh, increase and improve our numbers is, if we can, but the overall incidence in grin disorders is about 65% and two thirds are medically refractory. Age of onset, birth to 10 years of age and the seizure types are very mixed with generalized tonic and clonic focal spasms and complex seizures. Grin 2A, the incidence is 90% uh, or better, uh, but it's interesting that some seem to outgrow their epilepsy. Age of onset is birth to 10 years of age. Uh, seizure types, uh, often, very often in grin 2 a disorder, these are focal. Sometimes they can be present only on the EEG with something called continuous spike waves of sleep. Uh, also generalized tonic uh, and clonic spasms and complicated seizures. grin 2 b the incidence is about 50%. Uh, the uh, incidence of medical refractory epilepsy is 50% of those that have epilepsy. The age of onset is birth to 10 years of age. Again, mixture of seizure types. The GRIN 2D, it appears that epilepsy is uh, present in all individuals and it tends to be very severe and is medically refractory. And usually the age of onset is from birth. Since there's so few individuals with this, this is our current thinking, but hopefully it will change as we learn more. And the seizure types tend to be focal or spasms. And here are just some of the definitions uh, from the table. So diagnostic tests to consider. As I mentioned, if you're able to cell phone video this, that's great. Uh, 
the prose artist catches what you are seeing in the natural state that gets past the limitations of describing it. Um, cons, it's hard to do. You really do need a third arm unless you have a partner there who can do it. And you're not really capturing any physiological measurements associated with this. Always the best for seizures is video EEG because it pr provides the ideal recording conditions. But you have, have to be lucky enough to be, have lucky, I, I say this, uh, to um, have the EEG hooked up while uh, the individual does have the seizure or spell to capture it better. Sleep study with a video. Again, this is very similar to a video EEG. Uh, an EKG or a halter monitor, if you're looking for autonomic spells, again, these provide an ideal recording condition. Uh, again, you also have to be fortunate enough to capture the event during uh, when you're hooked up. Imaging, uh, if there's an overall change in, in what's going on in the, in the individual, I think this is useful, but otherwise repeat imaging is not really something that's generally helpful when you're trying to characterize spells. Seizure classification. So I think it's really important that you work with your clinician to ensure that you're on the same page. In other words, spell A, whatever you call this, uh, both you and your clinician decide that that was a seizure and they're gonna give it a certain name to that seizure. They're gonna have their clinical name like that was a tonic seizure or that was a cluster of spasms, or that was a complex partial seizure. So it's important that everybody tries to use this, the same terminology. If everybody knows what you're calling was a whoopsie, was a spasm, then that's okay. And one of my families, she said, oh, that she had five whoopsies yesterday. Well, I know what that was, and they know what that was, and so we can all document the same. And then also spell B, we know this, we know that when, when your individual does this, it's not a seizure. And it's just important that we all recognize that differentiating some seizure types is difficult, whether or not that's a seizure or a spell. But, um, but also within seizures as well, you know, what I may call a tonic seizure versus a spasm versus a myoclonic versus what another clinician might call, you know, the, the spectrum of what these different seizures look like can vary. But it's just important that your clinician tries to do their best to call them the same uh, as much as possible. As always, it's very important that families keep a diary uh, to track the frequency of the seizures and spells and so that you can understand what changes to the medication is, is work, changes to the medication regimen is working, what isn't, and what are side effects for each spell type. And I know uh, a lot of feedback, and also I know this from looking at the forms that you filled out for us in the registry, that uh, the questions that we provide to you, we use the medical terminology, and these are often very difficult to fill out. And so if it's possible to ask your clinician to fill them out um, to make things easier, that's great. If you can't do that, if you're able to send your, your clinician's notes in, that has been very helpful because we can see that, that families are having trouble filling things out. We go to the clinician forms that they've turned in, and this makes things a lot easier for us to try to understand what's going on. So treatment. So these are my opinions, but they're kind of borne out by what uh, we often do uh, in practice. Uh, there are no specific treatments at the moment for Grin disorders and standard therapy for each seizure type should be considered. And seizure types often have specific therapies such that there's specific medicines that I might use for spasms and tonic seizures that I wouldn't use or vice versa for focal seizures. And when to treat? Well, if, if you're only having one seizure a year, I would say maybe we don't need to treat that. But that's a, a clinical discussion that you need to have with your, with your clinicians as to when is the threshold to treat. But this is the general guideline uh, in pediatric epilepsy. Um, I suggest that the most be used is two anti-seizure medicines at a time and less transitioning. And another bullet that I should add here is try, try to make only one change at a time. So clinical trials that are randomized, blinded, placebo controlled in specific cohorts, for example, for example, only in GRIN1 individuals that have a loss of function change, these need to be completed in order to establish safety and efficacy of GRIN specific drugs. 
Otherwise, my concern is that these could be dangerous or harmful. I think that N of one or one-off situations should be only for extreme situations, such as an individual's admitted to an ICU. Um, there's multiple daily seizures, similar things in that regard. And they need to be undertaken only when the functional status is known. And if you are enrolled in the registry, then that's how we will know your functional status. And if you have questions whether or not this might be something that could be considered, your clinician can contact me. And then we'll go over together with the form and we have, we have a protocol of what we can do in these extreme situations. But again, it's important that everybody understands that we're doing something that I'm concerned about the safety of doing this. And it just needs, to, everybody needs to understand that before jumping into doing these sorts of things. So therapy really depends on what caused the spell, the nature of physiology of the spell, and the impact of the spells, the side effects of the medications, and the safety and efficacy of approved medications. Safety, uh, I think it's always important to ensure safety during a spell and a seizure. And so I have called these the three T and the fourth T of seizure first aid. The first T is time it, because if it's longer than five minutes, then that's often when you need to be administering a rescue or calling 911 or 999, whether, wherever you happen to live to access emergency services. When your individual has a seizure, I know that time goes into another dimension. You really need to, I suggest, look at your watch, call out the time so that everybody around you and you uh, tend to remember it. Uh, Put your child on their tummy or on the side because we want to protect the airway because sometimes you will throw up during a seizure and oftentimes there's a lot of secretions and doing being on your tummy or your side helps protect the airway. Tongue, don't worry if the child is the child will not swallow their tongue. Uh, sometimes there's little bites in the side, but uh, these tend to heal up well. And so I suggest not to worry about it. If the child is eating at the time that the seizure starts, be careful, you can try to do a finger sweep with, with your finger, but um, always be concerned that you, you could get bit because the jaw is often quite tight. And you don't wanna put a, uh, a spoon or anything in there because you'll break one, one of those nice teeth. The fourth T is T-Mobile. Um, that's not an advertisement, but it just add, lets me put a T in there. But if you can pull out your phone and you're able to video it with your cell phone, then this is always useful for your clinicians to see. So. Um, there's a lot more that I could say here, but I really think that I would like to, to get into your questions uh, and go over this and talk a little bit more. Um, but I do want to bring up the registry again. The question is, 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 why haven't you enrolled? Why haven't you provided an update to your forms? There is a new portal. And if you're in Europe, Asia, Africa, or other, that's Dr. Lemke. If you're in North or South America, or Australia, uh, the contact is Jennifer Sargent. Um, for our registry or a separate registry um, through Jennifer Bain at Simons and Columbia University down there. And as I said, uh, all of our registries uh, talk to each other because we're trying to, to limit the burden on families with, with uh, data collection in this regard. So I think we're ready for questions and answers. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and stop sharing and we'll go from there. Thank you very much. That was, uh, as a parent of an epileptic child, that made a lot of sense. And it's always really helpful to hear from the clinicians about, about your, your advice on, on these sorts of scenarios. Because as we all know, when you have a seizure episode happening, you tend to panic. So thank you for that. Um, we've got a couple of questions in the chat and I've got one that occurred to me as you were talking as well. Um, perhaps we could start with this one which has come in. Could Dr. Benke please clarify what he meant by N of one or one-offs? So what I mean by that is if there is a discussion about using, for instance, memantine or L-serine or dextromethorphan or ketamine or any of those grin specific drugs for which safety and efficacy have not been established in grin disorders. And I, I think that that's experimental therapies. I mean, sometimes we do get to desperate situations where there's nothing that we can do. 
and the child and the family are severely impacted such that the child's having multiple daily seizures, um, limited quality of life, they're in an ICU, and that, that's an appropriate time to have these discussions. Um, but it's a clinician discussion. I, I am not able to advise you, but I am happy to have a discussion with your clinicians about some options uh, if they get to that point. Thanks very much. Um, I'll just go back up to the to these questions in order. Please, um, everyone watching, um, do put your questions in the chat as well. And we've got plenty of time left, so hopefully we'll be able to get through quite a lot of them. Um, here's the next question. Uh, my son has had multiple EEGs and nothing has ever shown beyond epileptic spikes. We still treat as though it is seizures. At what point, if any, should we start looking into other reasons like a movement disorder or would our best bet to be to assume and continue treating as seizures? That's a really good question. And as I was saying, sometimes it can be very straightforward. We, we, every, everybody was fortunate. The spell of question in question was captured while you were hooked up to an EEG and everything becomes crystal clear. But that, that often doesn't happen and you, and you and your clinicians make your best judgment. I mean, it's, it's on an analog scale, you know, like I'm pretty sure that's a seizure. Or, no, I don't think it was. But sometimes you can't be sure. And so that's when you might consider, okay, well, let's, let's do a trial of medications and see if that improves the seizures or spells that we're having. And that then provides an additional piece of evidence that says, Okay, we, we tried this. They were looking at our seizure diaries together. We're calling the same spell a seizure, and that's what we're looking at. It improved or it didn't improve. And so then you say, okay, well, maybe that wasn't the right medicine. And so you could consider doing another medication trial. And then if it's not working and you're still having these spells, then maybe you need to do a longer EEG to try to capture them. It's not... Uh, you know, sometimes we have to do a, a three to five day admission to our epilepsy monitoring unit to try to capture um, spells uh, when they become really problematic and, and questionable in this regard. And so we, you do your best and it's, it's a clinical decision. And I, I tried to talk through how my thinking is and how I would approach it, which are fairly similar to the group that I, I work with here. Yeah, because that can be a big a big question for families thinking about whether they go down that route, isn't it? Because it can be an enormous disruption to the rest of the family if they've got siblings who are still supposed to go into school or whatever. And it's it's a big decision to come and commit that time if you're not confident in catching anything. But, right. Yeah. right. So it's, it's part of the discussion. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And um, the next question is here, um, is CSWS or ES, ES, you might have to remind us what those acronyms stand for, linked to a specific type of grin or functional status? And do you look actively for these? Right. So CSWS stands for continuous spike waves in sleep. And ESES is electrical status of epilepticus of sleep. And they're both generally regarded as the same thing. And so what it means is, is that when the individual and they're hooked up to an EEG, it's typically an overnight EEG. When they transition into sleep, there's a sudden change in the background and such that the record becomes filled with spike waves. And usually there is a spike wave index that the epilepsy specialist will calculate based on a certain period of time within the EEG. And they'll say that to meet criteria for these, uh, and that criteria has changed over the years, if more than 50% of this period of time is occupied by spikes, then they say you meet criteria for these. Now, okay, let's say you have 51% spike wave index versus 49% spike wave index. This is really an academic threshold. When I asked the, um, the physician who came up with this uh, cut off, I said, where did you come up with that? He said, I had to come up with something. Um, so it, it, it really is, it's, it's somewhat academic. But the reason why we think about this is because both of these EEG patterns have been associated with what we call an epileptic aphasia. In other words, the child has language, but then there's a loss of language and it can be temporally correlated to the EEG change and improving the EEG 
may improve the aphasia. Um, it has been seen with almost all of the disorders on, on a few occasions, but it is seen a lot with GRIN2A uh, disorders. Right. Thank you. Um, the, um, I've, list, um, I've noticed that no one else has come in with any other questions yet, although we had a, a thank you for your answer to one of them. I'm sure people out there have still got burning things that they'd like to ask. Now is your chance. You've got one of the world experts here, so you may as well make the most of him. But while we're waiting for any questions coming in from the audience, I've got one which um, hopefully we can use to generate a bit more of a conversation, which was... Um, the, the figures that you put up at the moment about the the, uh, the prevalence of different kinds of epilepsy with the different GRIN genes. Um, do we know anything yet about GRIA genes and GRIC genes and um, patients there? Do they have the same or similar levels of epilepsies or do we just not know yet? Perhaps if you're watching with one of these genes, you could put a comment in the chat to let us know because I think we're still sort of fairly in the dark about that, aren't we? We, we are. Um, I, th I think that they're becoming... Um, recognized as as causes of epilepsy and individuals who are getting more advanced genetic testing through panels and whole exome sequencing that's where we're finding these changes but i, I really think that there's an ascertainment issue um, and so we don't yes epilepsy is a feature of these disorders but we we're not able to confidently say what percentage and what types at this time Okay, and um, is your GRIN study expanding to include people with GRIA and GRIC genes? Will it do that in the foreseeable future? That's a very, very good question. And yes, our we've our we've our our um, uh, regulatory approval has always allowed us to collect these because I knew that they were going to show up eventually. So yes, <laughs> so, so your yes, families can contact us and join the registry with GRIA and GRIC. Uh, disorders as well. And the same is true for, for Dr. Lemke's registry. Brilliant. Thank you so much. That's that's very exciting news. Okay, we've had two more questions. Um, firstly, are there any trials being done in regards to THC and GRIN genes? There are no trials with regards to THC. And um, can we just unpack what that stands for as well, so, please? So I think they're, right they're, they're referring to THC as the main um, one of the one of the many components of of marijuana. So people talk about THC, um, but then there are different types of THC, whether it's primarily delta nine, uh, and then there's uh, cannabidiol, which is another component of marijuana. I mean, there are about over four hundred different compounds in marijuana. There are fifty that are thought to be neuroactive, um, but these are the two that have had the most attention. So cannabidiol is approved for the treatment of epilepsy associated with Lennox Gisto. And Lennox Gisto has a broad definition. And uh, as long as you provide, at least in the United States, if you say my individual has Lennox Gisto, then usually insurance will approve paying for purified CBD as it's really just it's a it's another treatment thing to consider, and I I can I put it in the same category. It's 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 we're using it like a medicine, and you can have the same side effects with CBD the same way you can with other medicine. Just it needs to be treated the same way as well. It's just another um, another wrench in the toolbox in trying to treat um, individuals with epilepsy, and it happens that that. Um, I think with our registry, because we have a lot of EEG reports that you guys have been very generous in sending in, I think we are going to be able to say at some to some degree how often we're seeing Lennox Gisto in the different grin disorders. And I think that that will be helpful. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, is there hope that a child with GRIA 3 and ESES, that the spike waves pattern will improve when the child goes through puberty? Uh, in general, because we, I mean, we've known about um, ESCS and CSWS for, for you know, over, I think it's at least almost two decades now. And so there hasn't been a decent trial in all comers of what is the best medicine to make it go away. And it's kind of evolved about 
what are the, the practices? Um, there ha has been talk of starting a trial, again, all comers to see what, what works best. It is known that some individuals will just outgrow their ESCS just as they get older, whether or not that's puberty, we don't know for sure, just because it, it, it's unfortunate, but it hasn't been studied um, sufficiently to, to say that yet. But we know that some individuals just outgrow it for whatever reason. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. We're on four anti-seizure meds for our GRIN 2A kid and still having multiple small seizures per day. Most recent advice was to increase one of the meds. Should we be rolling back? Uh, that's a, a really good question. I, I think, you know, my guideline, it's a guideline, it's not a rule, but uh, it's always good to try to be on two medicines at a time, a third if, if you're going to try to transition. So I think that the, the question to your clinicians is, is okay, yes, if the child is not having side effects from the current regimen, it would not be unreasonable to go up on, on one of those. But I think that the next question in the same, you know, almost the same sentence almost, okay, what's the plan to come off one of these other medicines that's not helpful? Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that there always needs to be a plan. And I agree, it's important that, to try to do one thing at a time so that you really know what is working and what isn't. But there should always be a plan to try to minimize the number of medicines. Because in my experience, if you are on four medicines, it's likely that you're having side effects from those medic medicines. And it's typically something like, like sedation. Mm, right, thank you very much. Um, I think that we seem to have run out of questions, but we're also nearing the end of our time slot, so perhaps that's okay. Um, Maureen, was there anything else that you wanted to comment from what you heard today? And, and perhaps if you have any questions for Dr. Benke, now would be the time. Um, I actually don't um, have anything to add. Um, Dr. Benke, you're like right down the block and I would just so love to be able to have dialogue with you going forward. We see one of your um, partners up at Children's in Colorado and she's amazing. Um, but hearing other perspectives and particularly a, a physician who is so familiar with Green One, which to most is still very rare and, and unknown, um, would be incredibly helpful. So I may be um, hitting you up. I will make sure our registry is up to date. I, I don't remember. Yeah, yeah we, should, we should talk more because we've been in discussions with the Green 2B folks about starting a center of excellence, if you will, with, with Dr. Park. Um, one of our epileptologists is the primary lead as part of this partnership and group. So That's we should talk amazing. more about that, especially as, as we would want you to be very involved in this process. That would be amazing. And uh, I owe it to my sweet girl. Fantastic. And hopefully we can all come and badge you with questions in real life at the, the conference next week. Someday, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I live in hope, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. and I'll, I'll be back on the, the Q&A later today. Is it the Ask Me Anything? Oh, cool. Brilliant. So. Thank you very much. So if anyone hasn't been able to reach their keypad just now and send us a question, then you've still got a chance before the end of the day. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's, it's always great to hear from you and uh, also great to hear Maureen and, and your story too. So um, the very best of luck with your next stages. And then um, thanks again for your time today. I think thank we'll you. call it there, guys. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks, Jillian. Thank you.